Hello, this is Justin Williams with the Wolfpacker Podcast. I'm joined this morning to cover the Gator Bowl loss to Kentucky, 23-21. Kentucky beats NC State. I'm here with former Wolfpacker and current Canadian Football Leaguer Mike Rose. You can give him a follow on Twitter at SavageMike90. You can follow me personally at Justin H. Will and give us a follow at the Wolfpacker on Twitter. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. You obviously are tuning in even after a loss, so you, you want to hear what we have to say. Subscribe to us, and it'll automatically download in your queue every time we have a new episode. Um, this is the season finale here, obviously, with the bowl game of our post-game reflection show with Mike Rose. But before we get too far into this episode and break down the game, and I want to talk about the season as a whole with Mike here uh, this morning, this podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending. With interest rates below 3%, there has never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again. Set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you are guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five-star reviews. Give Hunter Clawson a call today at 480-513-3992 or email Hunter directly at hclawson at jfqlending.com. That's H-C- L-A-U-S-S-E-N at jfqlending.com. JFQ Lending, Inc., equal access lender, licensed in over 40 states, www.jfqlending.com. And while you're at it, head over to thewolfpacker.com and use promo code PAC60. That's promo code PAC60 for a free 60-day trial on all of our premium content, news, and analysis on the website there. Of course, the regular or the football season ended for 2020, and we immediately take a step forward into the 2021 season. As loyal football fans know, as soon as the season ends, it gets into recruiting, which tells you the future of what's to come for NC State football. And we're going to get into that a little bit here uh, at the end of this episode. But again, use that promo code PAC60 for a free 60-day trial at thewolfpacker.com. So Mike, let's start off with just kind of your overall reaction to the 23-21 loss in the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl, NC State's second appearance in three seasons to the Gator Bowl down there in Jacksonville. And the last two trips haven't gone as planned. Uh, Two losses to two SEC opponents. Of course, this this one feels a lot different than the uh, Gator Bowl in 2018, or I guess at the beginning of 2019 uh, that year. Well, I guess it was on New Year's Eve, so it was technically still 2018. But either way, that was a very lopsided loss to a Texas A&M team that was, you know, clearly – in a, in a different class than NC State at that point in time. Mm-hmm. This Kentucky team, I think, is a lot more in a similar playing field as NC State in the national perspective, and it was a close game. It was a two-point game. Uh, both teams had chances to win there at the end. I think, you know, realistically, both teams were giving the other team opportunities that they didn't necessarily deserve at the end, and ultimately Kentucky comes away with the victory. Um, yeah. So just your instant reactions on what you saw yesterday and, you know, kind of what what you make of this game with all of the context considering you know the four best defenders on nc state were absent and peyton wilson drake thomas star linebackers tanner angle star safety and then of course nose tackle lee mcneil who's going to the 2021 nfl draft um so what, what do you make of the game and and what were your what were your primary observations uh, i would say my biggest observations are you know my man bailey hockman had a rough one but it was a game he was asked to do more throwing than I have mostly ever seen him be asked to do. You know, normally a Bailey Hockman stat line, in my, the perfect Bailey Hockman stat line to me is 20 for 29, you know, somewhere around there. But I, I do believe it was 27 for 40. I don't ever want Bailey Hockman throwing the ball 40 times. To me, that just sounds like we're throwing it when we don't have to throw it, especially with the success the run game has had. I mean, it has been the greatest run game like we thought it was the first two games, but it's still been very effective with Bam, Person, and Houston. And so I think that we definitely could have ran the ball more. I, you know, it's the first, it's the first time I ever think I'd ever say that to NC State, why we didn't run the ball more. Um, the defense did exactly what I thought they were going to do and better. So... I mean, athletically, NC State and Kentucky almost get the same type of guys. I believe, you know, because a lot of guys I know had offers from a team like Kentucky, you know, it just kind of depends. 
you know, which way you want to go. Um, I think, like, I don't think they get the SEC outclass us athletic guys. I, I think we're on a more neutral plane with them than a Texas A&M, per se. The, the, the biggest things that I saw were just, you know, inexperience. You see guys, you know, doing stuff like they have all season, been doing stuff that they probably just aren't used to or haven't repped enough. And, you know, without the big guy in there, you know, it's tough. And without Peyton Wilson, Drake Tom, without those guys, you definitely felt the impact of it was the definition of the word young. It was really young out there. It was a lot of young guys just doing what they can. And as a team, you hope you get as many as you can back. But a lot of these young guys would be a hundred times better next year because of all this experience in a year that's technically a free year for them. So, I mean, good kudos for this team and this young, young, young defense. Very, very young defense. Well, I completely agree with you in terms of the defensive observations. I mean, to me, to hold this Kentucky team to 23 points, granted, they're not a team that was going to light up the scoreboard, but when you're without your four best defenders right out of the gate, uh, and considering, you know, Dorn alluded to this in the postgame press conference, but you consider some of the uh, situations that the defense was put in. You know, you look at the red zone numbers that Kentucky was able to produce. They had four red zone trips, only made one touchdown of those four trips. So uh, credit to this defense. You know, they did what they've done best all year, which is kind of a bend, bend don't break, if you will. Once they get into the red zone, they've had a lot of success this year. And, you know, you think about those goal line stands middle of the season and you think about, you know, just their red zone effectiveness all, all year. Um, that has been a real strength. And I think you were able to see, uh, you know, some young guys that show encouraging signs for the future. Obviously, of those four guys that were out, you're going to get most likely three of them back next year. Uh, Aline McNeil being the only one going to the draft. And then, you know, Tanner Engel's just a junior. Peyton Wilson's a redshirt sophomore. Drake Thomas is a sophomore. I think all those guys are, you know, from what I've heard, have intentions to come back. So um, that, you know, you've got the makings of what could be a much better defense and potentially a special defense in 2021. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, I also like the point that you make about, you know, Hawkman throwing the ball a lot. I mean, we have not, this is really the first time since Bailey Hawkman has taken over when Devin Leary was hurt uh, in the Duke game that we've seen NC State's offensive game plan be, we're going to try to beat you by throwing the ball downfield with Bailey. 40 Hockman. attempts is a lot. That's, That's a lot. I, I mean, there have been flashes of that, and Hockman has actually, you know, compared to his first two games of what we'd seen last season in 2019, in the, in the last five or six game stretch, he was actually a lot more effective in downfield throws, um, you know, completed several 20, 30 plus yard throws that, you know, really – gave NC State opportunities to have success down the stretch and have the four and one finish like they did the four game winning streak to end the regular season like they did. Um, but, you know, the offense was clearly, I think that's what makes this game a little bit frustrating, a, a more of a disappointing end to an overwhelmingly successful season. And I do want to get to that. You got um, a lot out of this season that you were not supposed to get. Absolutely. No, I mean, it, in the, in the preview of this bowl game, I was talking with Matt Carter and I think we, both agreed. I made the point that, you know, no matter what happens in this bowl game, even if NC State were to get blown out in this bowl game, the season is still a success just because most didn't even expect NC State to be in a bowl game to begin with. Then you add in the fact that they played 12 games this season, you know, got all of the experience for all of these young guys like they did. I mean, the plan all along was a circle around 2021 as the year that mm -hmm. NC State could could go back to having another special season like they did in 2017, 2018. I still don't think that this team was as good as those teams, but they had similar results. And that is, you know, icing on the cake, if you will. Eight but and as, four looks way better. Oh yeah. Eight and four looks way better to a recruit than four and eight. No matter who you beat. Eight and four looks better. And, you know, I mean, that, and, Considering the four and eight season in 2019, NC State, you know, actually did a really great and and all the impacts that the pandemic made and how you really had to reinvent how you recruited these kids. They really had a pretty solid 2021 class, um, you know, pretty characteristic NC State class, really good character fits, culture fits, guys that are going to come in 
and be guys that they can develop into these, you know, potential future pros. Um, but they, they had to, they had to use that four and eight record to sell them. And so what they were telling most of these guys is look, that that's an outlier. That that's not who we are. That was an injury plagued year. We are more like the eight win consistent team, you know, that you've seen in 2017, 2018. And what this year did is it proved that it, it, it confirmed what these coaches were selling these recruits. And so, you know, from a, from a program standpoint, I think it's the state, you know, as much as it went off the rails in 2019, this year completely put it back on track to where it was going in the trajectory that it had in 2017 and 2018. So that's why I definitely call this season a success. I do want to close out, you know, our thoughts on the actual bowl game here. Cause as I was saying, even if they get blown out, I don't think it changes the way I look at this game. I do think what makes this game leave a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth to Wolfpack fans is that NC state had a chance to win down the stretch, even when Kentucky was able to stretch it to a nine point game there late, not so late in the fourth quarter, but mm-hmm. I think it was less than 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. I personally thought there's no, the NC state hasn't been able to move the ball on offense. It's, it's done. They had only scored seven points at that point. You know, Chris Dunn missed two field goals uncharacteristically. And when NC state can't even count on getting three points, you know, the, the odds of them, you know, getting, getting 10 more points somehow, some way to take a lead. I, I was skeptical. But then NC State quickly, you know, took advantage of some Kentucky mistakes. Uh, Kentucky picked up two personal fouls on that pooch kick that gave NC State a free 30 yards. So they're instantly in Kentucky territory. They scored in, I think, about a minute or so. Bam Knight runs in that 12-yard touchdown, makes it a 16-14 mm-hmm. game. And, and then NC State was able to force a quick three and out. NC State gets the ball again with, I think, about five or four minutes to go left in the fourth quarter down two with an opportunity to take a lead and really take control Mm -hmm. of that game. And unfortunately the first play of that drive as another drive in the fourth quarter was a bad interception by Bailey Hockman. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't look, it wasn't Bailey's game. I think he'd be the first one to admit he's disappointed in his performance. I'm sure NC state fans are disappointed in his performance. It's certainly, you know, not in he's played nine games this year. It's not in his top five by any means. You can't throw three interceptions. There's no excuse for that, but I think if you're an NC State fan, you need to be more thankful of the contributions that Bailey Hockman made this entire season than focusing on the bad that was in this game and maybe even looking back to the Virginia Tech game. There was a lot of bad from Bailey Hockman, but there was Bailey also Hockman gave you eight and four, man. A lot of good. Day, I know some great quarterbacks from NC State who did not go eight and four. I mean, this is you know, Porter who did the same thing. Guys who who had less and had more. So, I mean, Bailey Hockman gave you eight and four. And and, and realistically, I think Mike Glennon gave you an eight-win season. Right. I mean, mean, sometimes then I think Jacoby Brissett gave you an eight and four season. Like, you know, and these are guys that you would consider pro. These are pro guys. So, I think that Bailey did up to his capability. He gave you the best he could. Maybe he was asked to do too much. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know if that's overconfidence on the on the coach in Bailey or maybe that's what the game plan dictated that they wanted to air it out. They wanted to give Bailey an opportunity for next year to show, you know, you never really know. I think that with a team like Kentucky that, you know, they're old school, grinded out, you know, and that's what they did. You know, do I think that NC State could have won the game? Of course, you know, of course they could have. But I think that it just goes to show you that, you know, any team can be any team any given day, you know, especially when you have four guys who are on the the place where you struggled that has actually become a strength in a weird way, missing, you know, because the defense has become – the past few weeks, to me, the defense has been the strength. Yeah. They've pulled together and put together some great performances when the offense was kind of slow to start. So, to be fair, I, I think that, you know, the, the offense was flat. You know, there there it wasn't as crisp or as nice as I wanted it to be. I think some more running definitely could have helped that. But, they, I mean, they did what they were asked to do. So, I can't be mad at them for doing what they were asked to do. Yeah, I mean, pretty much – since the Liberty game, 
the tight, you know, low scoring Liberty game where everybody thought that game was going to be a high scoring affair between, you know, NC State's offense was coming off a 40 point performance over Miami and, you know, a 30 plus performance against uh, Florida State, you know, what, and then Liberty came in as one of the top 20 offenses in the country statistically. Everybody thought that was going to be a high scoring affair. It was NC State's defense that won that game and, and special teams, of course. The, the Vi Jones blocked field goal won the game at the end. Um, but it was defense that won that game. It was defense that really came up big in the Georgia Tech game. Uh, you know, down the stretch, this defense got a lot better than what we saw in game one when Wake Forest is able to score 42 points, um, you know, in the season opener. And NC State squeaked out a close three-point win just by simply running the ball for 260 yards, the best r- rushing performance of the year. Um, so from the offensive perspective, you know, there's I think there's – just as many questions on the offensive side of the ball as there are on the defensive side of the ball entering next year. There may even be more questions on the offensive side of the ball. There is a lot of talent. And then you, of course, throw Devin Leary coming back in 2021 after a full offseason rehab as the biggest, you know, thing to circle as to what NC State fans should be excited about. You've also got Bam Knight, who was named the MVP for NC State of the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl, um, who had a really – strong year. I mean, you look at his numbers statistically to his freshman year, pretty similar all in all. I think his yards per carry may be improved by, you know, 0.1 of a yard. Um, you know, he only played 11 games this season or no 12. So, I mean, 12, we're, we're comparing to 12 game sample size, roughly about 750 yards led the NC state in rushing both times this year. He was the second, uh, received the second most carries on the team as opposed to his freshman campaign, which he had the most, so, you know, something to watch there. I think Bam will pers- – I've, I've been on the Bam train all year. I think he's going to be the lead back next year. I, I think, you know, his, his, his play is more than proved, proved that down the stretch. Um, and a, a tough game for Ricky Person, you know, six carries, eight yards. Um, and I don't want to, you know, tell the entire season of Ricky Person just from his bowl game performance. He's had some really great performances this year. And, you know, those two guys together were – something that opposing defenses really had their work cut out for him in terms of scheming against NC state. Um, but, you know, I think moving forward to 2021, you know, Bam's that guy that you look at all of the running backs in the ACC that are returning. I believe he's going to be the leading returning rusher in the conference next year. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to be excited on both sides of the ball for NC state fans. Um, but all in all, you know, I think, you know, a two point loss to an SEC team that, In a normal year, and look, Kentucky, you know, the four and six record, I think people get caught up on that, but Matt and I were talking about it entering this game. You know, that was a 10 game schedule against the SEC and a 10 game schedule that was not their original plans. I think they went four and four, or they had a 500 record in the games that were on their original schedule before the pandemic, you know, made them play an all conference record. But they played the best of the best in the SEC. They played Georgia, they played Florida, they played Alabama. Those are all three basically automatic losses for anybody, and that's not a top 10 program in the country. So, you know, in a normal year, this is probably a Kentucky team that's a 7-5 and five Kentucky team or an 8-4 and four Kentucky team. So all in all, you know, to play a team that you're pretty much on par with to a two-point game without basically half of, your, of the best starters on the defensive side of the ball and without your main starting quarterback that, you know, you went into the season thinking Devin Leary was going to be the guy – All in all, I think that this was a pretty good indicator of what the season was. And now we talk about 2021. So um, any other thoughts on what you saw from the bowl game or should we start talking about, uh, you know, what what we should be looking for heading into 2021? Uh, I think it's time to move on, man. Put 2020 in the past mentally and physically. Let it go. Happy New Year. Move on. 2020 was rough. Yes. But it wasn't rough for NC State football, so that's good. Hopefully 2021 is an improvement on what we saw. Um, I mean, even doing the same thing would be great also. But it's just so much in 2021 with NC State football that we just don't know until day one. Like, you know, you got Ricky Person. Will he leave? Will he stay? Um, Will Bailey Hockman, will he stay? You know, because he's a quarterback. At the end of the day, that's a position where, you know, there's only one that plays. And no one in college football is trying to be anybody's backup quarterback, especially as a senior. So 
that that's that's tough. It makes a quarterback room extremely competitive and heavy. And, you know, that can weigh on a team. So, you know, that's something that Doran's going to have to think about, you know. And then defensively, those young guys, who's going to be the young guys to step up and take a lean spot, you know, Who's going to be, who's going to take Joseph or Daniel Joseph Day? Who's going to take his spot? You know, well, we don't know. We don't know if Daniel Joseph could return. He hasn't could return. Like, that's the thing. This is the season that has never happened before where you got older guys who could decide who are 22, 23, 24 to stay an extra year. They could play five years of college football. Like, these literally could be a 25 year old man against a, 18 year old you just don't know right right I mean you so you look at there is the possibility that NC State could be returning 10 of its 11 defensive starters I mean Aleem's out that that's I mean what what more could you ask for and then you look around the ACC and assuming that you know things go back to normal in 2021 it's more of a normal you know four non-conference games eight ACC games back in the Atlantic division um, you know, playing that slate of games, you look around and you look at Clemson, who's coming off of an off year for Clemson, the two loss Clemson team that frankly was outclassed by Ohio State in the college football playoff um, that we just I will say Ohio, it, fresh legs are a thing. I mean, now Clemson with the defense looks terrible. It looked horrible. They looked slow and they looked like they weren't schemed up well. But I will say there is a thing called fresh legs. Ohio State is running on fresh legs. There's a difference between 11, playing 11 football games and six to seven. That, that is a big difference. And plus, you know, you you hope by, you know, August, September that the vaccine is out there and that things are back to normal by that point. You're, you're you know, thinking that there could be a lot more fans in Carter-Friendly Stadium than there were this year. I, I have no idea what the arrangements are going to be, but that's going to give you a huge – you know, boost for those home contests once you get back. And I believe if they maintain the schedule itinerary that they had, Clemson would be coming to Carter Finley Stadium in 2021. So you never know. NC State's going to be, it's going to go from a youthful team to a team that's about average age, but has a ton of experience because of these last two years. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a team that, that fans could really get excited about this offseason and, and is a team that's going to be talked about you know, maybe not as much as a team as the team should be talked about entering 2021 because you've got Carolina, you know, 25 miles down the road and they just made the Orange Bowl and they got Sam Howell, who's going to be a, a Heisman candidate. They're probably going to be the media darlings, at least here locally. Oh, but yeah, sure. NC State could use that to its advantage. I mean, I, I'm on paper. This looks like, you know, you saw the 23 ranking in the college football playoff to end the season. I don't think if we're being honest with ourselves. Yeah, you know, I think NC State was a top 30 team this year, 35, if we're doing like a straight power rankings of, yeah, of the sure, programs sure. this year. Those rankings are – they're yeah. just out the window. Like, no one really cares about them unless you're in the top 15 because that means you're actually doing damage. Right. You know, 20 to 25 – well, I'd say 16 to 25, you get thrown around so much and people come in and people come out. You know, if you're in the top 15, that means, all right, you're beating people. You're doing something and – it's continual unless you're Notre Dame, but otherwise, <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing big things. Um, I think that the ACC is kind of in flux right now because yeah. we have top tier teams, but the bottom tier of teams in the ACC are pulling us down to the point that where everybody looks at the ACC the same way. All you got to do is worry about Clemson. You don't have to worry about any other team. As opposed to the SEC, you know, every year all those teams are competitive, even to the four and six Kentucky. So I think that's the difference in the bottom of the ACC, which literally rotates every two years. Right. That if we could pick up the bottom of the ACC and make them more competitive, then the ACC gets looked at better. And I definitely think that's more ranks. That's where the rank, like the, the bottom of the ACC has to become more competitive. They just have to. And, I mean, let's be honest. You know, we can't blame the bottom of the conference this year because you look at the bowl games. ACC went 0-5 and in the bowl games this year. I, it, it, we're including Notre Dame in that equation. I mean, look, in the ACC yeah, – man, got, they can't just jump in and out and be ACC when they need to be the, ACC. The that ACC stinks. got – they got – They two. added O's to – they literally added 
losses to the ACC's records without really being a part of the ACC. That's, uh, you know, I'm with you. That That's a conversation for a different day. But if you're the league, if you're ACC, you're going to take the title of we got two teams in the college football playoff uh, this year, just like the only other conference to do that, the SEC. Um, you know, clearly Clemson is, is a program that is capable of winning national championships. So, oh, yeah. look, an, an off year for the ACC, if you look at the national perspective, you didn't get those non-conference games to where – you know, you could see those ACC SEC matchups with a little bit, you know, more of a fair sample size. Um, but in the five bowl games that we did see this year, ACC did not fare well. And all and all of that is in saying that to me, the door looks open for okay. 2021. And and I think the coaching staff recognizes that. I think the players recognize that. And uh, and this year was a big part. I just think it is the first half of what will likely become a two two year story, if you will, of this kind yeah. of uh overall genesis of this team this roster that we know it's going to be very familiar in 2021 and we'll see what they can do so a lot to be excited for for fans and keep tim back oh he's keep tim back i know that was a weird game tim beck deserves to be there i can put my neck out there for tim beck not many other coaches, but too. Many. Well, here, here, I think NC State fans would uh, would agree with you. I mean, if you consider the circumstances of this guy coming in, completely we just new, had to deal with completely new to the program, didn't get a spring practice, didn't get spring ball. I mean, literally was teaching the offense virtually this mm-hmm. summer, and to have to, and you lose your your starting quarterback that you think you're going to have. You only get him for three games, so you you produce the type of offensive numbers that he's produced this year and you look at the overall body of work, Tim Beck has done an absolutely phenomenal job in year one. Um, excited to see what he's going to do with hopefully a more, you know, healthy and consistent, uh, you know, personnel that he'll, he'll have now in his second year of working with the team. Um, but overall, you know, I think a lot to be excited about. So, um, so let's talk about our game balls, Mike. Um, because we do need to wrap this up for the Gator Bowl. Um, you had a guy that you mentioned before we got on this podcast. I think that's going to be your game ball, if I'm not mistaken. Did I guess correctly? No. Ah, man, I could – you know, it took – He's a part of it. He's through, a part of it. Through, t- through 12 weeks, I still can't figure out your game ball methodology. So, Mike, I'm going to give the floor to you. Who's your game ball? I want to give it to the whole team and the staff, just because of everything they had to go through. They had to go through COVID. They had to go through players going down. I think that they did a good job putting together a season that I will personally say was I thought it was going to be the exact opposite. I thought you were going to be four and eight. I thought they were going to be terrible. And they proved me wrong. So I will be a man and I'll admit that you guys played much better. The coaches did much better than I believed. And I think that you definitely put a statement on a season that could have easily went the opposite way. So I'm giving it to the entire team, staff included. Well, that's really nice. Yeah, I, I, I like it. You know, I think to me, it has a little bit of a participation trophy feel to it, Mike. But you know, I mean, that's I'm a, what it is. That's I'm what a, I'm going to I'm 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 let you get away with it. All right. All right. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Uh, and credit is due to everyone. I mean, seriously, like we are very, very lucky. All the you know circumstances considered that. NCAA we didn't miss a game. 12 games. 12 we didn't games, miss one yeah. game. We didn't have to move a game or anything. That might. Well, we did have to. The season opener was moved. Oh yeah, so NC State, but but it was still played, right? Yeah. So you know, all in all, uh, if you're an NC State fan, I mean, the, you you want games to watch. You want to see what the team can do, what win or lose. So, um, you know, you look at all the successes this year. That might be number one, and just playing an entire schedule. Not a lot of teams in the country can say that. And uh, you at least know, not cre- Florida State. Credit, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you want to look at a program that you, if you want to feel good going into 2021 just just like a Florida state um i'm gonna give my game ball it's probably pretty predictable uh, i will shout out as an honorable mention your guy isaac duffy webb who played he great it, Mr. in duffy the absence had a great of great game walk on that's not that's not my game ball by the way i'm just saying it's sure. an honorable mention he's oh, the guy that was talked ball. about <laughs> he, he's the guy he, he, He's the guy we were talking about before the podcast, and and Isaac Duffy Webb has been really impressive when he's been called upon. We're talking about a former walk-on who earned a scholarship, I think, after his first season with the program, and 
you know, Tanner Engel has, is a star on this defense, but he wasn't able to be on the field a lot for NC state this year. I think it took until like the eighth game of the season for him to get over a hundred snaps this year due to injuries and targeting penalties. He missed this game because of his third targeting penalty this season in the regular season finale, one game suspension. And you have to make him an ankle biter. Just to, just to, we just got to make him an ankle biter, man. Just no more face ups, just ankle bite for the rest. Well, of the that I'm, I'm, I guarantee you that will be something that is addressed this off season is that 100%. Tanner, Tanner Ingle has to find ways to stay in the game. I mean, you can understand injury, injuries happen. You can't do anything about yeah. that, but the targeting. Well, the refs can, are going to be looking for him from now uh, on. Oh yeah. No, so no he doubt. Might as well learn how to ankle bite real easy. So, uh, but yeah, credit to Isaac Duffy Webb for, I mean, really his entire performance this season coming in with a very thin safety group. I mean, it was, we were already talking about entering this 2020 season, how thin the depth is at safety. And then you lose two of them in the Virginia tech game with Khalid Martin and uh, Rakeem Ashford, the Juco transfer that you got like weeks leading up to the season. And then that depth became even thinner. And, and Isaac Duffy Webb, I mean, was performing like on par with starters, you know, for a guy that was a former walk-on. So you really can't, ask for anything more from him so definitely an honorable mention there but on to my game ball as i'm sure you guys can predict i'm going to give it to zonovan bam knight uh nc state's leading rusher this season the mvp uh in the eyes of the tax layer gable for the wolf pack he had 12 uh carries for 52 yards and one touchdown average 4.3 yards per carry look wasn't nc state's uh day in terms of the rushing game but consistently all season bam has made the most of his carries and he's even identified himself as a explosive kick returner for this nc state team moving forward you know you think back to the one he took to the house against miami the 100 yarder i think he became like the second or third nc state player in history to return a 100 yard kickoff return led the team with nine rushing touchdowns this year had close to a thousand all-purpose yards with you know the receiving factors in as well so Credit to Bam Knight. Very excited to see what the future holds for for him. Because I mean, and he's sharing carries. People know, like he is sharing carries for a back of his caliber. He's sharing like I would say he's missing out on ten to eleven carries yeah. extra game. So you got to give him his props for putting up the numbers he's putting up while sharing uh, in a backfield where he is sharing. A lot of carries, even with Bailey Hockman, he's giving up carries to guys, to other guys. And I, and his name got a little bit lost this year in the in the national perspective because this league was just very rich on running backs. I mean, you, you Travis Etienne being the two time ACC Player of the Year, Bam's numbers were pretty much on par with Etienne's this season in terms of the rushing categories. I know Etienne got a little bit more involved in the receiving game. But then, of course, Carolina had Javante Williams and Michael Carter, two you know, yeah. first-team All-ACC type talent. So, when you look at that, I mean, on any normal year, Bam was a you know top two running back in the league. It just so happens that this year there was a lot of good running backs in the league. He ends up getting an All-ACC honorable mention. But I think next year, if the voters are doing their homework, he should be a front runner for a first-team type of consideration. He gets number one back carries which is 15-ish plus 15 carries a game this entire season. He gets well over 1,000 rushing yards, and I think that he's second team all ACC this year. Easily. Well, we'll, we'll say we'll, we'll, uh, it's going to be a long hiatus for us, Mike. I'm going to miss mm-hmm. you. We're going to have to get you back on. We're going to maybe maybe like a mid-off season type of review. I'm going to hit you up, and maybe we can all get right. a podcast going. I'm down. Um, but this man, uh, this, this already got me excited for 2021 because uh, there is a lot to be excited about. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe the results will probably be sim- similar in terms of the record overall. But I think next year, NC State's going to be a much better team and they're going to be able to hang with some much better better teams in terms of opponents. And they're probably going to have a tougher schedule. So, yeah. um, so anyways, successful 2020. Um I wish everyone a happy new year, just like Mike. Hope everyone had a great holidays. Thank you for listening to us all season. Um, follow us on Twitter before you sign off. Follow Mike at Savage Mike 90 on Twitter. You can follow me at Justin H. Will. Follow our main account at The Wolf Packer. Subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to us. We're on Google Play, Spotify, Apple Podcast app. Pretty much everywhere you listen to podcasts, you can also stream us on thewolfpacker.com. 
while you're on the wolfpacker.com use promo code pack 60 for a free six day trial on all of our premium content news and analysis we're going to have all the recruiting news and of course you know all the decisions coming up for all these seniors that could come back for one year so if you want the inside intel on all that what's to come definitely be sure to use that promo code and of course the uh, men's and women's basketball teams have some exciting products on the court this year too so that'll be something to watch here in the upcoming months uh lastly you can like us on facebook nc state wolfpack on the wolfpacker.com and signing off for one last time for the 2020 season for mike rose this is justin williams and this has been the wolfpacker podcast <laughs>